Thank you for your invitation to deliver this year's Peter Barcher Memorial Lecture. It's a huge privilege and a great joy. A privilege to be part of an event that honours a saint from among you and a joy because, well, I love talking about iconography. I have chosen to address the topic in three parts. Firstly, to tell my story of my engagement with icons. And secondly, to tell some of the history of icons and how to read them. And thirdly, to explain how icons are painted. Now, just a little aside, many will say that I should talk about writing icons rather than painting them. Now, this is a convention that is under debate at present. Painting is not less honourable than writing for expressing holy truths. Some leading world iconographers favour that we paint icons. It seems to be more a Western convention and English rather than Eastern Orthodoxy to talk about writing icons. Yes, we claim that icons are a special art form. It's special in the church, well, not only because it's religious art. It has a special place in the life of the church because it is liturgical art. It belongs within the church's life of prayer. And that's why I speak of icon making as painting. So, firstly, my story. I'm not sure where the interest started, not sure what first attracted me. I do remember buying a book by Soren Ness, a Norwegian iconographer who published a book called The Mystical Language of Icons. It includes a, a blow-by-blow -blow description of how to paint an icon of Christ Pantocrator and Mary. I bought some basic acrylic paint and had a go on canvas board. With mixed results. I was aware that Rob Gallagher had started an icon school in Kew and it was at a minister's retreat that I first saw one of the members of that school, Ken Gilson, working on his latest icon painting on a gessoed panel, mixing dried pigment with egg yolk. And so in 2003, I joined that class, a monthly Saturday class in Kew. I took a year to paint the first icon of Christ Pantocrator. Then, ten years later, as I approached retirement, Rob Gallagher asked me if I would help him in running the icon schools. By then there were three classes each month. The tasks included leading learning sessions, leading a worship reflection session and administration. Well, I had spent four years as a church bureaucrat and 30 years leading worship, so that wasn't too much of a problem. The problem was that I'd only painted about 50 icons and I knew that in the, in the Greek church you needed to have painted 200 icons before you would, would dare to, to teach the craft. Also, all my instruction had been from others in the class and books and, and a, a few videos. So I realised I needed a lot more experience and a lot more instruction. Now, choosing what icon to paint next is, is a continual issue. So I embarked on a project to paint the saints and the heroes of, of faith set out in the Uniting Church's calendar of other commemorations, our version of what other denominations commonly call the calendar of saints, days or uh, sanctoral cycle. I'm a couple of icons away from completing this project of 118 panels. So it's given me huge experience. The next I found my teachers, Philip Davidov and his wife Olga Shalomova. 
They are Russian artists and iconographers who live in St. Petersburg. They teach their craft in Russia, in the USA, in Canada, in Italy, in New Zealand, and each January, provided there isn't a worldwide pandemic, they spend three weeks in Melbourne teaching at the Australian Catholic University. They've exhibited their icons in Moscow, Washington DC and Melbourne. I've attended over five or six years and we have become close friends. Each year they provide a course in a particular aspect of icons, special skills like different ways to paint faces and hands and feet and clothing with, with all the, the folds and, and drapery, full length figures. Perhaps the most noted iconographer in the United Kingdom is Aidan Hart. He has written of Philip and Olga. An easy option for the iconographer is to copy past masterpieces, like a scribe duplicating a text. But is this the fullest expression of the church, of the church's tradition? A word which does, after all, mean to hand on what has been received. Philip and Olga have chosen the more difficult path, but I believe the more traditional, by expressing the faith with their own unique style. They use the recognisable language of icons, but give it their own emphasis and strive to distill the essence of their sacred subjects. They experiment with degrees of elongation, the currents and eddies of the figures, drapery, manifest the dynamics of the sacred event. Their influence on me has been profound. This is me, not Aidan Hart speaking now. The first change I learned was to paint at an easel, standing up rather than being hunched over my work on a desk. The second was to use good tools brushes of natural hair like Kolinsky and Squirrel. It changed my life. Much better control. My students now light up when they first experience a good brush. The next exciting venture with icons has been the overseas travel that Sue and I have been able to do in retirement. Whatever city we visit, we usually explore the art galleries and find the icon section. In Italy, we visited Ravenna and spent days walking from church to church to baptistry to, ch to chapel, all lined with wall to wall to ceiling mosaics. Mosaics were the main feature of iconography in Istanbul also, in Hagia Sophia and the Kora Monastery. In Greece, we visited ancient churches in Mystra, hills above Sparta, where wonderful uh, frescoes survive, as they do in the monasteries of uh, Meteora, perched on top of rocky crags. In St. Petersburg, we spent a wonderful afternoon with Philip and Olga, visiting their church with its modern frescoes and restored iconostasis. Iconostasis is the way they pronounce it. This is the restored Fyodorovsky Cathedral built to commemorate the 300th anniversary of the Romanov dynasty. On the island of Kishi was a, a little wooden church with a rustic iconostasis. Perhaps the most exciting venture was in the Tetrikov Gallery in Moscow. It was early on a Sunday morning. Our tour guide had done her thing and realized, uh, released us to explore. We headed for the Icon Gallery. No one else was interested in icons. We had the whole section to ourselves. And this is where we found the most famous of all icons, the Trinity by Andrei Rublev painted in 1425. I've spoken with friends who have seen this icon and they've seen it along with crowds and other admirers and at times before the selfie was invented and all photography was banned. Our experience was totally different. 
We had 20 minutes alone with this exquisite masterpiece and I was able to explore in detail with my camera. Very exciting. How to read icons. Understanding icons is helped by reflecting on some percep uh, perceptions and some history. Here are two views. A Protestant, Robert Leatham, has written, Eastern Orthodoxy is increasingly popular in the Anglo-Saxon world. It conveys a sense of mystery, of continuity with the past, of dignified worship at a time when some Protestantism is increasingly cheapened and trivialised. An Eastern Orthodox Christian, Andreas Andriopoulos, writes, liturgy practices in the Christian East have always been associated with a kind of sensory richness that many Westerners find difficult to understand. Many Western Christians find a plain church environment conducive to prayer and reflection on the biblical message, but when they enter a candle-lit, fragrant uh, Byzantine church, the walls which are completely covered with icons, they f often find the sensory overload distracting from what is more familiar to them, namely a religious environment that is centred essentially on the written and the spoken word. Images we now recognise as belonging to the tradition of icons were evident in the early centuries of the church. And catacombs and grave art are among early survivors. Perhaps the most notorious icons up to the first 600 years are in St Catherine's Monastery on Mount Sinai. These icons are significant because they survived the mass destruction of icons when the church legislated that icons transgressed the commandment against images. The reasoning behind the iconoclastic controversy is well expressed by John of Damascus. by John of Damascus. He writes, How can the invisible be depicted? How does one picture the inconceivable? How can one draw what is limitless, immeasurable, infinite? How can a form be given to the formless? How does one paint the bodiless? How can you describe what is a mystery? But in response to John of Damascus, but in response, John of Damascus went on to say, I have seen God in human form, and my soul was saved. In former times, God, who is without form or body, could never be depicted. But now, when God is seen in the flesh conversing with humans, I make an image of the God whom I see. I do not worship matter, so, so he's saying we, we don't worship the icon. He says, I do not worship matter, I worship the creator of matter who became matter for my sake, who willed to take his abode in matter, who worked out my salvation through matter. The second Council of Nicaea, 787 in the Common Era, made its ruling on icons in the church and set the parameters, where it says, next to the sign of the precious and life-giving cross may be icons of our Lord and God, the Saviour Jesus Christ, or of our pure lady, the Holy Theotokos, or of honourable angels, or of any saint. So the council was clear about the status of icons in the life of the church. They were for their veneration and not to be objects of worship in themselves. For the more these are kept in view through their iconographic representation, the church said, the more those who look at them are lifted up to remember and have an earnest desire for the prototypes. Now, when they talk about the prototypes, they mean the, 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 the saint them, saints themselves. Also, we declare that one may render to them the veneration of honour 
not the true worship of our faith which is due only to the divine nature but the same kind of veneration as is offered to the form of the precious and life-giving cross to the holy gospels and to other holy items also we declare that one may honor these by bringing them incense and light as was the pious custom of the early christians for the honor to the icon is conveyed to the prototype well controversy continued but was finally put to rest by the synod of, of constantinople in celebration on the 11th of march 843 in the common era a grand procession restored the icons in hagia sophia it is celebrated annually on the first sunday of lent as the triumph of orthodoxy after the iconograph iconoclastic period there were changes there were more prescriptions imposed that still apply to modern icons at least in europe they don't seem to apply so much in Africa, that is Coptic and Ethiopian icons. So an icon in Greek, Russian and other Eastern Bloc churches will have an inscription, a label to tell us who the image is. Christ has an abbreviated label. In Greek and uh, Cyrillic text, it looks similar and is simply Jesus uh, Jesus Christos, Jesus Christ. We know it's been abbreviated by the wavy line above each word. The sigma is an old form and looks more like our C. Except for icons of resurrection, ascension, transfiguration and baptism, Jesus will normally wear two garments of different colour. These remind the worshipper of the two natures of Christ, human and divine. Then the right hand of Christ and of many of the saints will often hold a posture of blessing. The five digits will be grouped in some way, sometimes in anatomically impossible ways, to remind the worshipper of the two natures of Christ and of the Holy Trinity. So groupings in two and three. There are some groupings used by priests and depicted in icons to simulate the abbreviation of Jesu Christos. Arthritis prevents me demonstrating this. A saint and Christ will always have a halo. Unlike some halos in Western art, the iconic halo will surround the head with the centre of the circle at a level of the eyebrow. Christ's halo will have a cross inscribed within it with either a decoration or letters own in Greek, literally the living one, or I am on many English icons. Saints are never depicted in profile. We always see two eyes. A Coptic priest explained to us one time that a figure showing one eye is a malevolent person. So Judas may appear in the Last Supper in profile. Figures in icons are not smiling. There is serious contemplation going on. Mouths tend to be small. There is more hearing and seeing than speaking. Often the image is painted on a space cut out to form a raised frame or border. The indented section is called a kivitos in Greek, a kovchek in Russian, meaning ark. It protects the painting. Icons are not signed by the artist, although many modern Greek artists do. I learned recently that monks, Greek monks, don't sign their work but that other iconographers in Greece may do. Here is an example of an icon I painted for the front cover of a devotional periodical. It illustrates some of my attempts at symbolism. Let me help us to read this icon. The patterns in the frame include an upside-down cross 
tradition has it that Peter was crucified upside down. He was a fisherman, so a net pattern is included. And there are outlines of tongues of fire. And Peter is standing on a pavement made up of portions of the text on the scroll that translated into different languages. This because on the day of Pentecost, the people there uh, could hear what the, they were saying in their own language. And so that's what I've tried to, to simulate. This feature is remembering that every language group in the, gr in the crowd heard the apostles in their own languages. Five languages from a selection of ethnic congregations in the Uniting Church were chosen for this icon. They're Tongan, Chinese, Indonesian, Korean and Tamil. And the sixth is the, uh, uh, the Garawa language, First Peoples of Australia from lands towards the Gulf of Carpentaria's coastline. Many of the great icons of the world can be seen in galleries and museums, but they rightly belong in churches and homes. Their proper place is where people pray. It is liturgical art. In Orthodox churches, there is a screen separating the nave from the apse and the altar. There are vestiges of this in Western churches as well. But in the East, the screen is called the icon screen or iconostasis. It has three doors. Only the priest can use the centre one called the royal doors, often decorated with icons of Basil the Great and John Chrysostom. In, in uh, two of the panels uh, may be seen the Annunciation with Gabriel addressing Mary. To the right of the royal doors will be an icon of Christ Pantocrator and to the left Mary Theotokos holding the infant Christ. John the Baptist, the saint after whom the church is named and some archangels will get places on the ground floor of the uh, iconostasis. Apostles, prophets and martyrs will be higher up. The Last Supper will get a central place above the doors and maybe the Trinity will be up the top. The iconostasis may be elaborate and screaming with gold. The reconstructed screen in St Petersburg has been left without uh, gold. Uh, these are, there are many, there are many in the Russian church who are turning away from gold because of its connotations of wealth, power and privilege. They do not want their churches to resemble the restored imperial buildings of the city and, the, and confuse divine power with civic power. This iconostasis has no gold. The village was too poor. Icons also belong in homes. These we saw in our B&B in Venice. These are in a restored village house in Russia. These are in the studio of Philip and Olga. These Celtic saints by Olga Shalomova are for an English market. These by Philip Davidov were a commission for a small country church. Incidentally, their studio is granted to them as professional artists and is an old Soviet era apartment no longer suitable for living quarters. We can also read the different styles of icons, recognize different schools if the background is red, it is probably painted in Novgorod. Here are four icons of the Annunciation. They're all the same and vastly different and all contemporary. Aidan Hart, English, but taught in a Greek monastery. Philip Davidov, modern Russian. 
Coptic style developed in recent years and Ethiopian. Well, should we, can we paint icons in an Australian style? Lois Brunt is a gifted artist in many styles. Here are two annunciations that she has done with clear Australian landscape and symbols. And this annunciation catches some indigenous art motifs such as dots. Notice also that Gabriel is Asian. An Australian icon that I think has the highest integrity is this one of our Lady of the Central West. The Diocese of the Central West of New South Wales says this of the icon. The newly commissioned icon was unveiled and blessed as part of the closing celebration of the sesquicentenary of the diocese on the 30th of October 2016, entitled Our Lady of the Central West. The icon shows Mary praying with us and for us. Bathurst-based iconographer Mary Clancy painted the icon, which she crafted with earth pigments, the colours coming from across Europe, the Middle East and Australia, representing the soil of many of the homelands from which the people of the Diocese of Bathurst uh, originate. Gold highlights are included as gold plays a pivotal role in our region's past and present. The border incorporates the totems of the local uh, Wiranjiri and uh, Gamalare nations. The four cent uh, cent concentric circles at the top represent the Cathedral of St Michael's and St John. Sixteen triple concentric circles represent the parish churches and 37 others represent small Eucharistic communities. These are joined by a wandering line of dots, the pathways which connect all these groups together. The icon was commissioned by Bishop Michael McKenna to mark the sesquicentenary of the Diocese of Bathurst. Well, I know from my own conversation with Mary, the artist, that local elders helped in the design of the totems and gave permission for their use. This, I think, uh, gives it the highest integrity. Well, painting icons. The definitive instruction manual for English-speaking iconographers was written by Aidan Hart, a New Zealander trained in Greece and teaching in Shropshire. He paints, carves and creates mosaics. He's the go-to book on everything to do with iconography. The task begins with preparing the panel. It is wood, sometimes, not always, with a kivitos routed into it. A linen or cotton covering is glued on with rabbit skin glue, one part dry flakes to 13 to 15 parts water and soaked for over three hours, heated to less than 40 degrees, applied with brush, all air bubbles squeezed out and left to dry. Whiting is added to the glue, one to one and a half times the volume of glue and painted onto the panel. 7 to eight, uh, 10 to uh, 10 coats, then sanded smooth with fine sandpaper. This is not, uh, th this, uh, there is not one way to paint icons in spite of what some will tell us. There's no one way. Many schools of iconography come pretty close to saying that their way is the way God intended, that this was the way St Luke who was supposed to have painted the first icon of the Virgin painted, and therefore uh, don't expect to get to heaven if you dare to paint icons in any other way. The legend is that St Luke fell asleep while painting Mary and an, an obliging angel dropped by and finished it off for him. 
Philip is at the most vitriolic when talking about some other iconographers. Some techniques are very dry, some are very wet to the extent of pooling the diluted uh, paint onto the panel in what is called petty luck or little lake. Let me tell you what I have been taught by Philip and Olga. The chosen image is traced onto the panel normally, but Philip and Olga have taught me to sketch pre uh, the preliminary drawings with pencil and then to sketch with paint directly onto the panel. It's great fun, much more satisfying. And some of my students are daring to try it too. The paint is mixed from dry pigments with egg tempera, one part egg yolk, one part white wine or water but the wine uh, version keeps for months in the in the fridge it's mixed in a small dish with a pestle painted with round brushes of various sizes kalinsky and squirrel load the brush by stirring and wiping off 15 to 20 times a dry brush gives a good control and allows application of thin coats better for getting good grading uh, and in the highlighting so let's uh, watch this video uh, it goes for it's 20 times the speed of normal speed to give you some idea of how this icon of uh, joseph of arimathea uh, is uh, built up uh, from the white panel to the finished icon. So we're painting with uh, yellow ochre and water and then adding the egg tempera to firm it up a bit more. We can starting to refine it using a uh, number three Kalinsky brush, then adding a tiny bit of Mars black to make it even more refined and we'll be using that also to put in the shading. Now that shading is in uh, burnt umber. Now this the two garments are blocking it in but we still see the shading coming underneath it. The green is terra verde, the orange is Mars orange and the tail is going to be white but we're using a titanium grey uh, as the base colour so that that will form the shadows. We've added titanium white for the highlighting adding it to each of the base colours and adding it progressively more as uh, we want more highlight. We're using uh, straight titanium white. We're putting it on in thin coats so that you can still see the grey underneath until the final highlights. The flesh tones are yellow, uh, golden ochre and uh, Ercolano red, a bit of terra verde and the highlights adding to that will, are the uh, again the titanium white and added progressively. And then the main features put in, in um, uh, burnt umber. Burnt umber is going on the beard before the white and build that up progressively to make a nice bushy white beard. And then also some Ercolano red in the, uh, for blushes. And then a yellow and uh, uh, titanium white uh, background on with a, a, a wide brush, a red, Ercolano red um, halo and inscription. For many, gold is an important part of an icon. We use 23 karat gold leaf transfer sheets there are several application methods. Water gilding is traditional. This starts with the application of clay bowl that is sanded mirror smooth, 
Water with a light mixture of gelatin is painted on and loose leaf gold is lifted into place with a gilder's tip of animal hair. The gold can be burnished with an agate stone. Oil gilding starts with bowl, with a bowl surface uh, or an acrylic sealer. Japan size is painted and when this is what's called squeak dry, the transfer gold is pressed into place. So the Japan size is, is a very light glue. This cannot be burnished and it gives this uh, sort of stippled look. A modern method of gilding that gives a very shiny finish is the Kolner Instacol system. The base is painted onto the surface and transfer gold is pressed into place after breathing on the dried base. A single wipe with a cotton wool gives a, a result most closely resembling water gilding that's been burnished. Gold assist is a method by which lines of gold are applied. The paint must be very dry, it's dusted with powder and glue is applied with a fine brush. One traditional glue is reduced beer, reduced so much that it's like treacle and it's then mixed with water and the gold uh, is scraps from previous gilding jobs and dusted onto the tacky glue. The powder prevents the gold adhering to unwanted areas. It is dusted away when the job is complete. Gold can be embellished with decoration either by tracing the design to the bowl or base with a pointed tool the gold will give, uh, 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 will rest into the indented design. Another method is to draw the design on tracing paper and then place it on the gold and trace it again with a ballpoint pen. Well, icons are gaining in popularity across the Western Church. Catholic and Anglican churches are more likely than not to have some icons usually of Christ and of the Virgin Mary. Protestant artists are enjoying learning iconography. I think we of the West need to remember that the icon tradition we are embracing is a gift from the Eastern Orthodox Church. We who paint icons do well to respect the traditions of this craft, remembering always it belongs to the prayer of the church. As we approach icons, the saints and the holy stories come to meet us to inspire our prayer for godliness.